welcome back. Um, we are going to do this next session as a, as a panel session, so hopefully fairly relaxed. Sorry if you can't quite see us uh, at the back, but um, hopefully you can hear us all right. Um, so we're, we're going to concentrate on the two cases, or two of the cases that you heard about earlier, um, Schultz uh, and then Taliski, and uh, it's going to be a sort of non-specific, but just hopefully interesting discussion about those uh, two cases. And obviously there's um, opportunity for questions as well, if there's anything you'd like to know about them. Uh, that's because people involved in them are, are present. So let me introduce uh, the current uh, panel. So uh, to my left is Claire. Uh, well, you know Jonathan. Uh, I was looking Claire, at Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claire Garnett, um, who is a, a catastrophic uh, lawyer at uh, Clyde & Co. Uh, and a uh, partner there and has huge experience uh, of... Uh, complex and catastrophic injury claims, but is also uh, a very experienced horsewoman uh, who ran her own uh, yard and has a number of horses of her own. So she could be an expert in her own cases, uh, but uh, fortunate for us, we have Charlie as well, who she's employed, uh, certainly in the case of Schultz. And so Charlie Lane to my right, um, probably needs no introduction, uh, but he's probably the most experienced, uh, or what, at least one of the most experienced, if not the most experienced, a question expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what he says, the eldest. Uh, <laughs> expert in the country. Um, his CV, which is probably already a few years old, says that at that point he'd done over 1,200 uh, expert reports, appeared in more than 70 uh, trials. Um, but his experience uh, of horses covers every aspect of their uh, existence. Uh, he was the uh, uh, commander of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. He was the uh, team leader or team manager rather of the uh, Atlanta Olympic eventing squad. Um, he was a jockey, an amateur uh, qualified jockey. Um, he was qualified to race against professionals. There, there isn't an aspect of horse management that he's not aware of. So we're very pleased to have him along. And <coughs> myself and Harriet, who um, Harriet's a junior in Outer Temple Chambers. She's got many years of um, uh, trial experience in uh, all types of oppression <coughs> uh, claims. Harriet and I were instructed for the first defendant in Schultz, and we were instructed by Claire uh, and her team. Um, at the time, they were at BLM, moved to Clyde Co. Uh, and our expert on the first defendant side was Charlie Lane. So, uh, we, you've heard a lot of the facts about uh, that case already. Um, but I'll try and put it in a bit more context uh, for you. Um, our client was uh, Miss Ball, who had a 20-year-old uh, Welsh uh, mare, Class C mare, uh, who had now become lame, and she <coughs> couldn't use the horse for any sporting activities any longer, so she decided to find a nice retirement home for this animal. And she was very careful in finding what she thought was the most suitable retirement home and uh, paid a princely sum of £250 a month for this horse to be given um, a grand retirement. Um, <clears throat> she chose uh, Surrey Grazing, which uh, was a retirement home for horses near Oxshot on a place called Stokes Heath Farm, uh, where, you, as you heard, there were about 24 <coughs> horses who were all calm, sort of sedate towards the end of their uh, lives. And uh, she paid this sum in the expectation that the horse would be uh, well looked after. Um, sadly for her, the horse and one other escaped from the field and, as you know, ended up on the A3 at the Oxshot turnoff, uh, where both horses were uh, involved in collisions with vehicles. The claimant was the rear seat passenger of a taxi or minicab that hit Lowry, which was our client's horse, and uh, the other horse, Fox, was actually hit by three separate vehicles, one after the other. Um, obviously, both horses sadly uh, died at the scene. So, uh, you had a claimant, uh, entirely innocent of all this. She was the backseat passenger of the taxi. Um, what were her remedies? Well, <coughs> she uh, could sue the taxi driver, uh, who uh, had hit a, uh, an unlit stationary object in the middle of the carriageway. Um, the other main target, you would think, was the uh, owner of the, um, the, the riding retirement home, or the, sorry, the, riding, the, the retirement home for the horses, um, who was a Miss Miller. She was the second defendant, 
and uh, there was a claim in negligence against her for allowing the horses to escape. Um, but also, um, she was a keeper of the animals uh, because she was in possession of them at the time. And so there was seemed a pretty good claim one way or the other against her. Uh, sadly, for the claimant, she was uninsured, uh, which left the claimant with a problem. So uh, the claimant then looked further afield and at the de definition of keeper. So <coughs> under section two uh, of the Animals Act, you can see it's the keeper of the animal who's liable or potentially liable. And under section six, uh, a person is a keeper uh, if they own uh, the animal or have it, has it in their possession. So Mrs. Miller of Surrey Grazing had the horses in her possession. Uh, but our client, who thought she wasn't in any way responsible for this horse, in fact, was potentially liable because she was the owner. Uh, and fortunately for her, <coughs> through her BHS, <coughs> she had uh, insurance. Uh, so the claim that went to trial was just against her, and you'll hear a bit more about the tactics and, and um, considerations that led to that position um, in, a, in a moment. But uh, the claim against her was purely under the Animals Act, and there were a couple of different factual possibilities as to how these horses escaped. Now, one of them was that they were um, panicked out of the field by vandals or third parties unknown, um, and they're in a state of panic. They galloped down the road for several miles, as it happens, uh, and ended up on the A3. Um, and those circumstances would be very close to the Mervahidi factual circumstances. Um, where a horse is in a blind panic or bolting, um, it's clearly dangerous, as Anne-Marie Taylor said earlier, uh, and the court found that in, in um, Mervahidi and Henley. The alternative factual scenario was that it was the fencing that was inadequate and the horses didn't leave the field in a panic state, but they uh, left simply because they were able to wander out. And uh, that was the position that we, as the first defendant, uh, adopted because that was what we thought the evidence showed. Um, the second defendant, Mrs Miller, the one who owned the livery yard, uh, I think it was a bit conflicted. She was both sued under the Animals Act and in negligence. So it was in her interest to argue that the animals got out because they were panicked in some way. But then she had to sort of work out how she might defend the Animals Act side of it, which was a bit of a problem for her. Um, but you'll hear a bit more about what happened with all that. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is um, just pass over uh, to Jonathan, um, because Jonathan is going to tell you a little bit about some of the challenges <laughs> that the claimant had with this bit of a nightmare of scenario uh, that she was facing. Thank you, Nathan. Well, you've very um, succinctly uh, summarised the, the bind in which we found ourselves, and I, I, I find, feel a little bit like uh, Ben earlier, um, <laughs> talking about the case I, I lost. Um, but it does throw up a number of quite interesting points, and I'll just spend a little bit of time running uh, through those, although, of course, um, given that the claim was only pursued against um, the first defendant, uh, Mrs Ball, and settled against the other two, to some extent I have to be careful uh, with about what I say because of confidentiality. But, th th yes, the difficulty that we faced uh, acting for the claimant was that she was plainly a, an innocent party, very seriously injured young woman. The obvious defendant to pursue was Mrs Miller, the occupier of the land. Uh, both uh, in negligence, because the horses had escaped, prima facie, uh, one could say, uh, therefore, it was, uh, it was due to inadequate fencing unless she could prove otherwise. Uh, and she said, uh, as, as Nathan has indicated, no, no, it was all due to vandals, uh, and therefore raising the possibility that these horses had been frightened. And that was what had caused them to escape. So that... Uh, then, given the issue with her lack of insurance and arguably at least, so it seemed, lack of, uh, of means, certainly that was what she said and it was investigated, uh, meant we had to look elsewhere. The owner of the horse, uh, Mrs. Miss Ball, was potentially um, liable as a, as a keeper, as Nathan has said, and then there's the taxi driver. 
uh, on the basis that uh, if you're driving uh, at night, you should be able to stop, says the Highway Code, um, within the distance you can see to be clear, although in reality we were <coughs> not convinced, that the far from convinced that the judge would uh, agree uh, that that necessarily, or agree that that uh, would um, result in the taxi driver being found liable. So that was the situation that we faced. Um, and, and I think the practice point here is, what do you do? Do you, do you sue all the defendants, or do you just go after, after one and, and focus on, uh, on an individual? And the view we took for various reasons, one of which being limitation, the other being um, that if you've got all, all three in, they, they, there may be a, a prospect of, of reaching an overall settlement, was to do that. The, the downside, and this is, I think, the real the practice point here, is you know, if you're acting for a claimant, whilst that has some attractions, as I've just outlined, um, <coughs> you can lose control of the litigation because the defendants then all started arguing amongst themselves, pointing the finger at each other, contribution claims and so on. Um, disputes about whether or not we should have ADR, if so, what form it should take. It became a bit like herding cats. <coughs> Uh, and um, so that was that in turn led to more time and expense uh, in the litigation. So that's, I think, one downside to bear in mind. Uh, the other is, uh, and this can apply in all sorts of litigation, um, when you start getting into experts, and as Nathan said, there are a number of two different expert disciplines uh, in this case, there's always a risk that if you've got multiple defendants, they go off and get their own experts, and you then end up in a in a two against one situation. Uh, and although, of course, quantity of experts shouldn't trump quality of their expert evidence, you know, it's never a great position to be in where you've got two experts saying something different to your expert. So there are all those considerations, and I just sort of put them out there as, uh, as issues that when one's faced with these sorts of situations, it's worth having in mind. If I could just briefly touch on one other point, which is causation. As, as Nathan has said, um, the um, first defendant's case, which was accepted by the trial judge, was that these horses had not been frightened. They just wandered out uh, of the, the field where the fence had fallen down. A and therein, I think, is an important distinction between certainly how the Schultz case was decided and other well-known cases where horses have escaped or animals have escaped, Merva Heedy being the obvious one, where it was established that the horses were frightened by something they had barged down a fence, plainly in a state of panic, and travelled some distance onto the road. And then the other more recent case of Williams and Hawke, that's the case of the cow steer um, that jumped a six-foot wall and forced its way through hedges and undergrowth for some distance and again got onto the road, and the judge held that the steer in that case had been frightened by something. And it just makes it much easier for a judge to find that at the moment, uh, or at the point of the, uh, of the collision, which, of course, is the relevant point for the purposes of causation under the Animals Act, if the animal has been frightened when it left the field <coughs> of the enclosure, it makes it much more likely that the judge is going to find in the claimant's favour, whereas if, in this situation, the judge was not persuaded that the horse uh, had been frightened or the horses had been frightened when they left the field, that then impacts on the judge's approach to liability under Section 2.2. Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, and... Uh, uh, I hope of some of some help. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, so, as you can appreciate, when Jonathan brought in three parties, there was <coughs> a lot of issue uh, issues about contribution proceedings. And Harriet's just going to mention some of those from the def first defendant's point of view. Yes, I, I was dealing with the case at that point and had to make the kind of thorny decision about um, whether to um, proceed with Part Twenty claims against the the taxi driver and Mrs. Miller. Um, as far as Mrs Miller was concerned, we thought she was really the, the obvious defendant. I mean, there was obviously the issue with, with her lack of insurance. Um, but, but our assessment of the case was that the, the most likely finding at trial was always going to be that the, the fencing was defective. Um, so we, we pursued her with a Part 20 claim uh, and also simply adopted the allegations of negligence as against um, the taxi driver. Um, 
th there was an RTM in the case about four months before trial, um, uh, as a result of which the, the claim against the third defendant was, was discontinued uh, by the claimant. We didn't really have the expert evidence to continue to pursue the taxi driver uh, for an indemnity or contribution. But the, the situation with the second defendant was much more complicated um, because clearly we didn't think she was going to be good for the money. Um, but on the other hand, we felt that the accident was probably her fault. Um, and in the end, um, it, it also came down to the evidence that she was likely to give a trial, which was going to be probably counterproductive to our case in that she was raising the possibility that um, she'd had problems with uh, people trespassing on the land before and that people had come onto the land and had probably pulled the fences down and um, uh, and herded the horses out. And, and quite a lot of the expert evidence, Charlie, was, was with you dealing with the the case theories advanced um, by, by Mrs Miller, who, uh, in, in fairness to her, was a litigant in person for most of the action. She, she because she didn't have any money, eventually got uh, competent counsel to deal with her case through advocate later in the proceedings. Um, but in the end, we, we took a commercial view on um, whether it, it was beneficial uh, for, for her to remain in the action, and we decided against that. Um, because we thought she was going to cause difficulties for us in terms of her evidence. So, so um, thank you, Harriet. The, the person who lived and breathed this case almost as, uh, as much as the claimant's team was, was Claire, um, and it's probably uh, imprinted uh, in her frontal lobes. <laughs> as we've got. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to Claire to let you know some of the issues she had to face. Thank you. I had a, an email on the 4th of January 2016 telling me there'd been a multi-party accident on the A3 and that David Miles, who's just over there, he came along today, hello David, he'd been out to do an investigation initially and we were told, led to believe there were seven or eight potential claimants. This was a catastrophic accident. The road was a mess, it was absolutely horrendous. As fellow horse owners, the last thing you want to do is see the entrails of your horse all over cars. You know, these are photographs you can't unsee once you've seen them. So it's, it's a whole um, catalogue of horribleness about the case. And from that, we had to manage... Um, a lovely insured lady who was probably the nicest lay witness I've ever had to deal with from the beginning. All she cared about was the claimant, which just made me think, oh, there are nice people. She was just delightful. And to deal with her and insurance companies um, was a balancing act because you have to manage the claimant, um, the insured's expectations, and you have to manage your insurance company's expectations. Now, when we first were instructed, it was one insurance company and the book of business was sold on and basically over the life of the case, which has gone on for seven years now, there were four different insurers and different people you have to explain the intricacies of the Animals Act to and they're saying, what rubbish is this, for goodness sake, and, and you have to explain it to them and right back to basics and you also have to then manage your insured client as well. As I said, she was an amazing lady, a massive respect for her. Um, she was awesome, and even to the point when we were at trial, we kept her away from the recon evidence, didn't let her see photographs. <clears throat> she was concerned that the judge would find it disrespectful that she didn't attend for the day, but we didn't want her to see the pictures, did we? We just wanted her to be protected. Um, so it was just the, 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 the balancing act of making sure that insurers were happy, confident in our advice, constantly sense-checking the evidence that we've got, stepping back, putting our claimant's hat on and saying, well, what would they do? What will they say about our evidence? And making sure that at all stages we were absolutely sure about the advice we were giving. We're talking about big numbers here. The costs were eye-watering. If we'd lost, we would have been going down for a lot of money. So it was very difficult to keep everybody on side and keep all of the balls in the air. But massive respect to Vicky. That said, I have huge sympathy for the claimant. We've said it all the way along. Massive respect and, and sympathy to her. And we said so at the end of the trial, um, offered her our sympathies. But we can't forget that Vicky Ball lost her fluffy baby as well. And to her, this was a massive, massive thing. Um, it's the worst thing you could possibly have happen to you with, you know, having a horse one minute, it's there on five-star livery, next minute it's not. So that's kind of... I'm, 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 yeah, Harriet's talked about the part 20. I mean, if any, anyone says part 20s now, it makes me feel quite faint. I think, oh, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> because there's so many part 20s, I'm going to get you too. And, and it's just a, it's a pile of a mess. It's a mess to unravel it. So just stay away from part 20s. <laughs> just stay away. <laughs> Very wise words. Exactly. Well, um, 
as you know, uh, on, on section 22A and 22B of the Animals Act, um, expert evidence is receivable onto those issues. And uh, this case was no different. So we had Charlie Lane uh, as our expert uh, for the first defendant, and there was a Professor Edison, uh, who was the expert for the claimant, uh, who was a professor of uh, animal behaviour, uh, retired. Uh, and uh, the, another expert you may have come across, Nicholas Stevens, who I think was instructed by the third defendant before um, they dropped out of the litigation. So I'm just going to ask Charlie, really, what was the different approach of, that you experienced in, in this case in relation to the expert evidence? Well, for, for much of the build-up to this case over the years, um, when it were, there were three experts involved, myself, uh, Nicky Stevens, um, and uh, John Edison, and Nicky and I are both horse people. Nicky, Nicky is another very experienced competitive international event rider. And we saw pretty much eye to eye on every question we were being asked or every bit of information we were given. Um, Professor Edison uh, did not have a strong equestrian background. He was a, a, a scientist, an animal behaviorist, and he had written a number of papers, I can't remember how many, certainly well in excess of 40 or 50 scientific papers, but none of them actually had the word horse or equine in them. They're quite, quite a lot of bovine and ovine. Um, and he, he was, but he was talking about how animals, warm-blooded animals, will behave in certain circumstances and what their reaction to, to fear will be. Whereas Nicky and myself were saying, well, what would we expect our horse to do in this circumstance? And I think that, that well, I, 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 the judge did have difficulty in taking the very scientific and slightly opposing view um, that John Edison produced. John was, he was very, he was very good, he was very fair, and the trouble was that quite a lot of time he had to say, I defer to those who handled horses and know horses, which didn't assist, I think. Well, that's right. I think he'd been on, involved in the case uh, which involved the cow on, on the road. Uh, Williams and uh, Hawks, Hawks, was it? Yeah. yeah. Um, where his knowledge of cows certainly came in, in handy, uh, and the judge accepted in that case that um, the behaviour of the cow was likely to be as he said it was, but he, he was on a lot weaker ground when it came to horses when faced with, um, with, with Charlie and Nicola. Um, there was another, well, one of the aspects of, or well, the main aspect of the case was what was the behaviour of the horses on the motorway, and so we were trying to show that they were calm, the claimant was trying to show that they were likely to be in fear and panicked. Um, so in order to try and establish what happened on the motorway, we, we resorted to uh, reconstruction evidence from traffic or vehicle reconstruction experts. And Harriet's just going to mention that side of it. Yes, so basically the only evidence about what the horses were doing came from some pretty vague evidence from the taxi driver that he'd, he'd seen a, a, an object just before he hit it. And then with the other collision with the horse called Fox, um, the, the driver, James Rayner, again had seen him, thought he knew which way the horse was facing, but again, the evidence was, was pretty vague. Um, and um, we felt that there was a danger of the court extrapolating um, from the fact that they were on the A3 in the middle of the night with cars going by at speed, with you know, lights on and noises, um, that the horses would have been in a set state of distress. And that was really the inference that um, the claimant was inviting the court to draw. And um, so what we sought to do through accident reconstruction evidence was to find out some, some more hard data about um, where the horses were likely to have been positioned and whether they were likely to have been moving. And that, that um, evidence really came from the uh, pictures of the damage to the vehicles. Um, and, and effectively, if, if an animal's moving, one would expect it in collision with a car to produce a sort of diagonal pattern of damage, whereas in this case, the pattern was largely straight back to front. Um, and also by reference to where the, where the horse ended up, which in this case was through the roof of the car. Um, and the, the evidence of the first defendant's expert, Victoria Ayres, was that based on that, the horse was likely to have been straight across the road and probably standing still 
or, or if moving, only moving very, uh, very, very slowly. Um, and so although the burden was on the claimant to prove the behaviour of the horse at, at the time of the, the impact, um, that really bolstered the first defendant's position that the characteristic was unlikely to have been displayed at the time of the, of the collision. So it sort of filled an evidential gap, which was quite useful for the first defendant in, in defending the claim. So the conclusion of the judge, as you heard earlier, um, was that uh, the, the horses weren't acting uh, in a panicked way, uh, that they were calm, um, and that the accident occurred because they were large, heavy animals standing in the middle of the highway. Um, and that isn't a characteristic uh, or a dangerous characteristic within uh, Section 22B. So this case doesn't set any legal precedent uh, it's very much on its own facts, but at the same time, it does give an example uh, whereby not all behaviour of uh, horses on the highway is necessarily going to be uh, falling within the act. It's got to be dangerous uh, behaviour. Um, and it, the case also shows that you know, you've, got to be, you, you've got to get home on your pleading. So the, the claimant, the way it was pleaded by Jonathan, was that the horses were in fear and panicked. And as that wasn't found as a fact, <coughs> therefore, uh, the claimant couldn't succeed. Um, so you've got to be very particular about how the claim is pleaded and uh, what the characteristics that you're relying upon are and what the circumstances are, and then hope that the evidence um, fits that particular um, pleading. So <coughs> that's Schultz. Um, I think we're going to move now on to Taliski and Richard uh, is going to come up. Richard Brooks is going to come join us. Yes, as Nathan says, we're going to move on to the second of uh, the two cases. Uh, Freddie Taliski, is, uh, as I understand it's pronounced, and, um, and Graham Gibbons, <coughs> which um, Sam has already helpfully uh, outlined uh, the uh, background to, but I thought I'd spend a little just a few moments um, running through that, uh, and then um, Charlie is kind of going to talk us through. We've got the footage uh, of uh, the relevant part of the race where the accident happened, uh, and he'll talk us through that, and then, as before, we'll each uh, offer our thoughts. Um, just before I do that, uh, to the extent that he needs any introduction, um, Richard Brooks um, has kindly joined us uh, on the panel, partner at... Uh, RWK Goodman, as they now are. Uh, he heads the PI department in London. He's joint head of the firm's racing and bloodstock team. But he also has ridden out himself uh, at racing stables for a number of years, uh, and he has a particular interest uh, in horse racing. And indeed, in uh, his capacity, remind me, Richard, with the... Professional Jockeys Association. Professor, thank you, Professional Jockeys Association. He was initially approached in relation to the Taliski case and gave certain uh, advice. Um, uh, so we're delighted to have him on the panel. Charlie uh, was also uh, instructed uh, as an expert, an expert for Graham Gibbons, the defendant in this case, so delighted to have him here as well. He is also a steward <clears throat> at, um, at various courses around the southwest, and as we'll uh, come on and discuss in a moment, the steward's uh, involvement uh, in this case was uh, was a relevant factor, so it'll be interesting, I'm sure, to hear from Charlie uh, on that aspect. So, turning to, uh, and Nathan, I should say, I, I'm sure needs no introduction, um, but um, particularly why we're keen to have him on, because he's an editor of, of JPIL, the Journal, Journal of Personal Injury Law, and he prepared that very helpful article, case comment on uh, the Taliski case, which some of you, I hope, will have been able to pick up uh, as you came in earlier. So, uh, just a few points on the background to uh, the Taliski case. Freddie Taliski suffered a fall um, in October, back in October of 2016, even though the trial wasn't until uh, 2021, and tragically was rendered uh, paraplegic. He was riding a horse called Nellie Dean, which was in collision with a horse called Madam Butterfly, ridden by Graham Gibbons. And very rare for, a, for four horses, that was how many were involved in the incident, uh, to fall in a flat race. Um, and um, the stewards uh, held an inquiry 
uh, after, straight away after the race and found that um, the uh, alleged interference uh, by the defendant, by Gibbons, was accidental. Um, that inquiry was held only a few minutes after the race. None of the jockeys who were brought down uh, were able to give evidence. Uh, so the stewards only heard from Gibbons and one other uh, jockey, Pat Gosgrave, who'd come in second. Um, uh, and um, we'll hear uh, a little bit more about this, but uh, the judge ultimately uh, found uh, at odds with the decision of the stewards that it certainly wasn't an accidental uh, interference by, um, by the defendant. And essentially the issue for the court was whether uh, this was just a racing accident, incident, which was what uh, Gibbon said, or whether his riding uh, involved a sufficient lack of care to render him liable in negligence, which was, the, was Taliski's case. So, um, if we could... Uh, just... Do you want to show the film? Yeah, I say so we could move... I was going to say, just, be, just mm. before we, we actually run the film, um, so what we're going to see is, is a film showing the, from the start, from the horses breaking up from the starting stalls at Kempton Park. It's an eight furlong race, one mile. The accident happens at about four furlongs. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Kempton Park as a racetrack, and if not, then I really urge you to become familiar with it. It's a great racetrack. <laughs> and especially on a February evening with the sleep coming down. <laughs> anyway... We're, we're going to be particularly interested in uh, two horses, but there's two others that you want to take note of. So, coming out of stall two, you're going to see Graham Gibbons, who was riding Madame Butterfly, and he's wearing pink checks and white sleeves. Um, Freddie Tedeschi, uh, riding Lily Dean, comes out of stall one, and he's got pink and blue checks with blue sleeves. I'll test you on this later. <laughs> Pat Cosgrove, who gave one set of evidence to the stewards and another set of evidence to the court is, uh, and came second, he comes out of stall five, he's in a blue body and sleeves and with a green hat. And I, I'll point them out when, we're, when they're running. And Jim Crowley also gave evidence uh, in the court case, but not to the stewards because he was in hospital, um, having his nose straightened out. And he comes out of stall four uh, and his light blue body and sleeves. And the same four So, so we've got at the moment this is Freddie Tilisky just in the lead and Graham Gibbons just behind him. And Pat Cosgrove is there with the green hat. You've got several different camera angles. Um, for the stewards, we've got four different cameras, and we can see all those camera angles. Later, they can be syn they are synchronised, and <coughs> we can set pay their back in slow motion on the racetrack on the day. So you've got um, Graham Gibbons in the lead, Freddie just behind him on the inside. They're just coming to the point of the accident now. They're on the bend. <laughs> Now you've only had a glimpse of that, but as I said, the stewards had four camera angles and they could play that back and look at it in slow motion, and we did the same in the court at the time. Brilliant. Charlie, thank you very much indeed for um, talking us through that. Um, definitely makes all the difference when you can actually see it rather than trying to, uh, trying to describe it. Um, so that... Um, is uh, what happened. The question then, of course, is uh, does it give rise to any liability? And uh, bearing in mind the high threshold, which uh, it's well established, uh, is the test uh, uh, for establishing liability in a sporting context, um, how does a claimant go about trying to prove liability? And uh, I'll ask Nathan to uh, expand on that. Okay, well, um, so I'm just going to touch on what the, the test is really um, in, in cases uh, of sports injuries. Um, in any sport, particularly horse racing, there's a high 
degree of risk um, inherent in the activity and the participants voluntarily accept that risk. Um, so whilst, and in some sports, serious injury can uh, result and, and whilst the risk of serious injury uh, is an accepted risk, sport isn't exempt or immune um, from the law of negligence. Um, so what are the principles uh, and, and, and when is uh, an incident going to be one that's going to be actionable? Um, there's rarely any issue about whether a duty of care is owed. Uh, the issue is always about whether uh, that duty has been breached. And there wasn't very much before Taliski uh, in the way of um, precedent from horse racing cases, uh, certainly not flat racing cases. Um, it was, it's been well established that um, there's no liability in sports for errors of judgment or lapses or oversights which any participant might uh, be guilty of, particularly in the context of a fast-moving contest. Um, and that was the finding in the case of Caldwell, which um, Sam referred to uh, earlier. So Caldwell uh, against Maguire and Fitzgerald. Um, that was a national uh, hunt race over jumps uh, where a claim was brought against the two defendants uh, who, it was alleged, had left insufficient room for uh, a pursuing horse to come through on the inside rail, uh, as a result of which the horse behind uh, that horse uh, fell and the claimant sustained serious injury. Um, the, claimants, well, the claimant didn't succeed there, but that case, uh, if, you, if you need to look at the, uh, the, the standard and duty of care, um, that case is, is, is a great starting point. And uh, the trial judge there, Holland Jay, summarised uh, the principles which were then uh, endorsed by uh, the Court of Appeal. Um, there are five principles that he uh, espoused. The first is that each contestant owes a duty of care to each and all of the other contestants. Uh, and whilst each contestant is deemed to have accepted risks which are inherent in the sport, that doesn't eliminate all duty of care of the one participant to the other. Uh, secondly, uh, that the duty is to exercise all care that is objectively reasonable in the prevailing circumstances. That phrase, prevailing circumstances, is very important because, thirdly, he addresses what are the prevailing circumstances, and they may be very wide in scope. They include the demands that is inevitably made on the participants, um, inherent dangers, the rules, conventions and customs of the sport, uh, the standards of skill uh, and judgment uh, reason reasonably to be expected in that sport. Um, and in passing, it's worth noting that uh, the standard of care is an objective one, but it is adjusted to reflect the skill required of the particular participants. So uh, professional jockeys racing at Kempton Park will be judged by a higher, to a higher standard than amateur jockeys riding some old nags on a, a Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> As for breaches of the rules um, in sport, in Caldwell it was held uh, that the fact that the rules of the sport may have been broken did not decide the issue of liability. That's just one of the circumstances uh, to be taken into account in the prevailing circumstances. Um, the fourth point made was uh, given the nature of the prevailing circumstances typical in sport, the threshold, th threshold sorry, for liability is inevitably high. Uh, proof of a momentary lapse of skill or, or care from an error of judgment will not be enough. Um, these will be considered no more than incidents inherent in the nature of sport. And one must never forget that particularly in racing, it's, the whole purpose is to try and um, steer a thoroughbred horse with a mind of its own at high speed around a course with numerous other uh, participants uh, in order to get the best pace possible. So there's going to be a lot of um, give and take and rough and tumble. Um, professional jockeys are making split second decisions and have to rapidly assess changing circumstances and uh, the conditions and adjust their riding accordingly. That's all taken into account in the prevailing circumstances. So uh, the fifth um, proposition or, or question really is, is recklessness required? Um, the reality is in practice it may be difficult to prove a breach of duty absent proof of con conduct which amounts to reckless disregard for a fellow contestant's safety. Uh, 
the, the, the Court of Appeal have been a little bit unclear about whether recklessness is uh, required. In, in 2004, I did a, 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 a hearing in the Court of Appeal in a case called Blake and Galloway, which involved boys throwing uh, bits of bark at each other at a, a school playground, and uh, one sadly lost his eye as a result. And uh, it, there, the Court of Appeal said that uh, if the defendant who'd thrown the bit of bark was to be found uh, liable, he needed to have been reckless or to have shown a very high degree of carelessness. And from that, it was thought that recklessness might really be the test. But it's, that decision has subsequently been interpreted as not laying down a requirement of recklessness uh, in every case. So there is no ubiquitous requirement of recklessness. The overarching duty is to exercise such de degree of care as is appropriate in all the circumstances. Um, in racing, you're probably going to need uh, something akin to dangerous riding, uh, as adjudicated by um, those in the know in that uh, particular profession. But even dangerous riding isn't always going to be something that amounts to negligence. So that's a whistle-stop tour of the standard of care, particularly in relate racing. Yeah, Nathan, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. It, it makes clear what a high hurdle a claimant um, faces in a, in a case like this. Um, so having set, the, set out the legal framework, can we turn to Richard and um, ask him for his thoughts on, on, on the evidential issues in this case? Obviously it came to you at a very early stage, I understand, what your thoughts are on, on that and how things subsequently developed um, uh, to the liability trial sometime later. Yeah, um, I've got a long history of uh, representing jockeys, uh, often in stewards, well, not in the stewards' inquiries on the day when the referees have made a decision as to whether or not they've been guilty of any offences, but uh, representing them at appeals to what was the Jockey Club, what is now the British Horse Racing Authority, uh, have represented several of the jockeys in this case. Um, in, in different scenarios. Um, and I was asked to have a look at the case just on behalf of the, their association, just to see if there was any scope for uh, making a claim. And I felt that there wasn't. Um, I think I made the mistake of putting the hat of the judge on. Uh, if I were the judge looking at the evidence in front of me, I would have made a decision that um, Gibbons was uh, not liable. What I failed to do was take into account, or was unable to do, was take into account that the evidence, the evidence that the judge on the day uh, heard. Um, I, I don't think I took into account the fact that these stewards on the day at Kempton had decided this was accidental because uh, we know that stewards are, have to make fairly quick decisions, uh, which aren't always correct. and. Judges, judges won't be bound by the, the referee's decision. Um, I did know about the case of uh, Caldwell, Caldwell and Fitzgerald and Maguire because we'd advised in the background on that. Um, <coughs> and obviously there's no need for reconstruction evidence in this case because as Charlie's said, there are any number of views that you can watch in the slowest of slow motion with synchronized timing to see exactly what's happened. And I just formed the view that um, the standard of care was not, uh, was, you know, the jockeys had ridden to the standard of care required. Um, I didn't take into account the, the fact that poor old Mr. Gibbons was, uh, a shadow was rather cast over him by the judge because uh, he was criticised for not mentioning the fact he'd been banned for more than a year for uh, a drugs offence and try, uh, coercing a young apprentice to uh, substitute his sample for Mr Gibbons. Um, I, and the judge slated him for not mentioning this in his witness statement, and I thought that was a little bit uh, unfortunate. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of... Uh, Fitz, uh, Coldwell against Fitzgerald and Maguire, the defendants in that case were almost revered. Mr. Uh, Mick Fitzgerald is now a commentator, a uh, very successful jockey. Adrian Maguire is certainly revered back at home in Ireland. Um, so we were dealing with different characters. But what we didn't know at that point was the 
the way the evidence would play out, and it was um, uh, partly coincidence, I think, the way in which uh, one of the witnesses was uh, found to be, uh, it was found he was going to be helpful, that was Ryan Moore, that was just a chance encounter, they I meet think. on a plane or something. Yes. Yeah. 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 And he obviously said something supportive to uh, Freddie Tulisky. And um, the other witnesses on the day seemed to come in behind Mr. Tulisky mm. um, and support him. Yeah. And, and Pat Cosgrave, who who had given evidence at the steward's inquiry, which was supportive of Gibbons, or certainly not critical of him, then seemed to have had a change of heart, Man. shall we, shall we say? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, yes. They, uh, and, and gave evidence for Tulisky at trial. Yes, the, the lads, the jockeys, are very well practised being on the carpet in front of the stewards and, and trying not to blame each other. But I think... Uh, Possibly in the cold light of day, they might say, but um, yeah, they, they um, adjusted yeah. their recollections. Yeah. Richard, thank you. Before we move on to Charlie, can I pick up on one supplemental point, which is you mentioned about Ryan Moore, who was um, Tulisky's expert on the standard of racing. Again, it's one of the unusual features of the case, as the judge um, mentioned in, in uh, her judgment, that um, Ryan Moore's expert's report was written entirely. Uh, by Tulisky's instructing solicitors. Um, he said, I didn't write reports. I'll tell you what I think. You can, put, you can put it down in writing. And the judge wasn't, well, considered that that was acceptable. And I just wonder what your thoughts were as a, as a solicitor, if you faced with that situation, <laughs> what, your, what your views would be. Um, well, it, I can think of two situations, what, one of which is in relation to... Uh, uh, a case at Doncaster, which is actually mentioned in this case report, that th this judgment <coughs> when a uh, horse uh, put its foot in a hole mm. in the middle of a race and came down, and the uh, judgment uh, trial on liability found in favour. I got involved at the time when I was only very young uh, on the quantum trial, and the accountant who we drafted in to produce evidence about the losses of the jockey always very complicated producing evidence for losses for self-employed sportsmen. He'd never given evidence in court, so um, I was able to uh, put his words, uh, well, yes, his words, of course, in, into a report that I drafted. And the second time I uh, can think of a case was James involving James Mackey, who many of you will remember, especially Anne-Marie. Um, he was instructed as a joint expert in a case in the early 2000s, and I... Um, I didn't. I took the view he wasn't helping the court in the way I wanted him to, so didn't sack him because you can't sack a joint expert, I suppose. But I got a, another expert. Again, he he he'd never given evidence in court, but he knew how to put on a bridle. So as I, I was able to convert what he said, and but of course you've got to be careful, haven't you? That they're not your views. It's only what the expert would say under questioning. Absolutely. And, and one of the strike again, one of the interesting points from the judgment is that um, Gibbon's uh, legal team uh, asked for disclosure of Talisky's solicitor's notes of their discussions with Ryan Moore, with the expert. And the judge said, yes, those notes should be disclosed so that the judge... Uh, could be satisfied, indeed, he could be cross-examined about you know, whether what was in his report was actually what he had said to the solicitors, and indeed the judge was satisfied that that was the case, and the report went in. So some interesting procedural points there. Charlie, stewards' inquiries, I mentioned already that the, the stewards absolved uh, Gibbons of, uh, uh, of any wrongdoing. He was found, it was found to be an accidental incident, but of course the judge found otherwise and really didn't set much store uh, by uh, the outcome of, of the steward's inquiry. Um, you, you're a steward. Some people may know how these things go on, but I think it would be helpful to just to hear just briefly what you know, what happens at a steward's inquiry. Okay, so so things have actually changed a lot in the steward's room between the day of this accident and now, and in fact by the time of the, the trial. Mm. Um, at the time of the the case, there were three amateur unpaid um, stewards supported by a professional steward. Um, we now have one amateur stewards panel chair, which is the role that I fill, and we have two or three professional stewards. 
and the stewards panel chair's job now, while while being in a position to, to take direct comment and provide direct input, is there as much as anything else for checks and balances on the guys who are doing it day in, day out, some of whom are retired jockeys, some of whom have, have come to other, other areas. But so it, it's changed from what was effectively a, a, a somewhat amateur heavy stewards panel to a very professional. Um, we are keen to say that the stewarding has not changed in any way, but the way that it is done has changed. Um, the other thing was that at the time, the steward, the, it, it is normally expected that the stewards will make a decision on the day uh, based on the evidence that they see, which is largely the, the camera evidence, but also <coughs> listening to the, the witnesses. And in this case, of course, there were four potential witnesses who couldn't be there because they were somewhere within the paramedic system. And it was, the judge certainly took the view that it should have, that, that maybe this would have been a case when we, the stewards should have adjourned and pushed this off for two weeks uh, until we could have got uh, the majority of the, the jockeys in to, to discuss the case. And that has been another change. Although within that, the stewards would still have had to decide whether that if if the stewards had decided on the day that Graham Gibbons had deliberately caused the accident or dangerously caused it, then he he won the race and that he would have lost the race. And there is pressure to say, right, you know, you're waiting for the bookies to pay out on all the countries, yeah. not only here but across the country and in fact across the whole of the Far East, which is also watching our racing and betting on it. Mm. So it's it's changed dramatically in that way. Yeah, well, that's really that's really interesting. Um, I think it just goes to show, and this this isn't just for stewards' inquiries, but any case where there's an initial investigation or report, you have to look very carefully at the circumstances in which that investigation report was was carried out and prepared uh, when taking view as to whether, uh, in subsequent litigation, it will be persuasive to some extent, uh, if at all. Um, and uh, it was interesting in the Coldwell case, I think it was the other way around, wasn't it? The uh, Yeah, they found the, the, uh, the, the jockeys had been careless, and careless. they had a three-day suspension, I think. Uh, the, yeah, and then, and then Mr Justice Holland at trial absolved uh, the defendants uh, of any liability. So, there we are. <laughs> what, one thing that certainly crossed my mind is, is if, we, if, if the stewards had adjourned on the day, and had reconvened in two, two weeks later when Freddie Tuliski would still not have been available, but the others would have been, um, Jim Crowley and Steve Drown. Um, if they had heard their evidence two weeks later and the evidence had still led to the stewards deciding that it was accidental, it would be interesting to know whether that would have influenced mm -hmm. the judge at all. Yeah, yeah. Isn't the problem, though, that they always blame the jockey who's not there? Um, no, they, they, they don't always blame the jockey who's not there. They blame the jockey who didn't offer them a lift to the race. <laughs> um, but there are various reasons. As, and you can, you, can all, you can all imagine there are different reasons for either supporting. Uh, it would depend a bit on... Uh, it, it, if there's interference between it, if, if the guy who's been interfered with really doesn't think he was going to win the race, then he may get easier on the the, the, the jockey who's interfered with him, if on the other hand he thinks there's a good chance that he may win and he doesn't particularly mind whether the guy's taking him a lift home, then he, he may come down harder. And certainly when the stewards are looking at the film, they do have to sort of think to themselves, is what I'm seeing in front of me on the screen tie in with what the guy's telling me? Mm. And it's not always the case that it does tie in. <laughs> Great, Charlie. Thank you. Well, um, we're going to have to move on, sadly, in a moment. But before we do, uh, does anybody have any questions, either in relation to the Liskey, to Liskey case or the or the Schultz case? So, yeah. um, in relation to the Liskey case, there's mm. three uh, a point that Richard touched on. You were saying mm. how Mr. Gibbons had a, a shadow cast over him mm. um, during the trial, and I think the judge went on. To, to criticise him for not disclosing a number of infringements in relation to cocaine use, in relation to his alcohol use. But then we <coughs> say that goes to his character, uh, and that's not 
in dispute that doesn't go to, to a point in dispute and doesn't make a finding mm. about it. Um, there seems to be some sort of contradiction there. I wonder if uh, the panel had any views on um, whether there are any learning points in respect to drafting witness yeah. statements and how you deal with regulatory infringements that may or may not be yeah. relevant. Um, yeah. Should, should, you, should you volunteer adverse information, which at the same time you want to say is, isn't relevant? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nathan, Richard? Uh, well, I think Claire made the point. I anticipate yeah. what your opponent's going to say. So if I were uh, Mr. Gibbons' solicitor, I might have anticipated that would crop up. It only happened after the, this raise, but it nevertheless was almost bound to be an issue. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure as well how... I mean, it... All the things that happened to Graham Gibbons were well reported in the racing press at the time yes. and, and raised again each time he got something else slightly wrong. Judges are impressed by <laughs> candidness, so yeah. my, yeah. my sort of if in doubt, it, always confess and avoid is, is the way I go for things, you know, just get it out in, in the open and then nobody's going to worry about it again. That said, that said, we know we've all spoken to people and taking witness statements, they come and give me the worst now, tell me the worst so that I know what I'm facing. Yes. Don't give me any surprises down the line. Yeah. And they always say, I didn't think it was relevant. Yeah. They always do. And mm. so we, we, we know what we're facing. Yeah. It's always better as if it comes out in their witness statement yeah. rather than in cross-examination. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't always appreciate that. No, they don't believe yeah. it. <laughs> you're, you're managing the information that way <clears throat> as opposed to it coming up by the other side. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. Any others before we move on? Yeah. Does the, yep. the panel think this was the right decision? <laughs> it was the right decision on the evidence. Yeah. Um, Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you were very fair, Charlie. I mean, you, what you said is if, if X happened, then you thought that would be highly careless or possibly dangerous, and that she found X to have happened. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems as though it's probably the right decision on, on the evidence. On, on the evidence. <coughs> Thank you. That's Catherine. What <laughs> I, 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 I did say that if, if he had ridden dangerously, then, or if he, had, if he had deliberately cut in, I then went on in the next paragraph to say I don't think he deliberately cut in. But. Good. Catherine. Mm. didn't write his own report. Um, in, in some of these areas, we do struggle with experts. I know experts, I know Charlie's here, I know Pam Marie's here, but when you are looking at sort of specific um, issues, how did it come across for those that, you, that were there in terms of cross-examination of the experts? Mm. The judge, it seems like the judge was very careful once you see the notes and such like to make sure it was an expert report rather than witness statements. Yeah. I'd be a little bit concerned um, that we expert into the witness statement. Yeah, how that would play out in yeah. cross-examination. Are you, are, you, are you offering a gift to the other side? Yeah. Yes. Um, Charlie, I, presume, were you there for Ryan Moore's uh, cross-examination? Yes. Presumably were, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, th I think that if, if what he had been saying didn't tie in with what it was written in his report or was, was said in a way that was actually going to contradict it in some way or could be taken to be contradicting it, then it wouldn't have been helpful. But you, you've always got the risk. Do you choose an expert witness who's an expert of being an expert witness and knows a bit about horses? Or do you choose an expert who's champion jockey and knows sort of about writing reports? Mm. Yeah. Well, I would choose a part 35 expert any day. <laughs> <laughs> You certainly got to be prepared to have your <laughs> have your notes disclosed. Yeah. I think it's going to be a roller coaster ride, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. great. I'd be more with it makes my blood run cold. Yeah. It really does. It makes me feel quite unwell. <laughs> I assume you couldn't have said to the court. Well, in our joint discussion, I found that he didn't really understand his own report. Um. But uh, I, no, but I was busy writing our joint statement. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Good. As we sat in Ke at Kempton in the, in the jockey's uh, changing room um, between rides. Good. Well, it's not mine. Uh, I think with time, time marching on, if people have got any more questions, 
perhaps they could catch up with uh, with us uh, 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 when we have a drink uh, in a little bit of time. But, Josh, Jonathan, um, can I just say on Schultz, I, I did say about pleading points. Um, I just wanted to make it clear that there was no criticism of your pleading no. on Schultz. <laughs> and she was peerless, of course. No, no, uh, none, none taken. It was just that the evidence didn't quite, uh, in yeah. the end, uh, uh, support the pleadings. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much to all our, our panel members.